four, and we are live. live, I believe. Just give it a little bit of buffer, because last time you started talking, and then they, it was like, we missed your awesome intro. Right, right. Five, no, no, no. We're good? Yeah, we're good. We're good. Okay, Intros excellent. First. Intros first. Um, so, well, according to everyone's uh, polls and, and whatnot, uh, between, it was between Russell Brand and Enlightenment, and uh, in the end, Enlightenment has won, which I think Austin and I are kind of excited about just because it gives us a lot to discuss, especially for the first episode. So, went. yeah, exactly. So, I, I, mean, I guess... Let's just tell people about, tell a li very, very quickly, in case people didn't see episode zero, which was what we did. We did an episode where we talked about the project and we let people, like, sort of contribute to us in the intervening week about what to do this week. That's where the poll and everything was. And... We should also point out that Foucault and the episode of Black Mirror where the Prime Minister of Great Britain and Northern Ireland fucks a pig on camera <laughs> both lost out pretty badly to... It was, it was really all Enlightenment, Russell Brand, Russell Brand, Enlightenment. Um, and, uh, yeah, the Enlightenment came out on top, which fits with our whole program. Lewis and I... Uh, Lewis is a much more academic... Uh, type much more deeply grounded in academic philosophy. I'm a journalist who studied philosophy at university and still has opinions. And this week we're going to explain the Enlightenment to everyone. Yeah, and discuss it. And, well, kind of figure out what the legacy of Enlightenment in, is today, I guess, right? And uh, But I, I guess we should start off a bit for, I guess, the uninitiated viewer or, or whatnot. Like, just a, bit, a couple of things that came out of the Enlightenment. Um... I mean, I think one of the things, one of the biggest things that I, I believe comes out of the Enlightenment is this whole idea of rationality, rationalism, um, natural law, and, and of course, you know, it's a cultural movement that is uh, supposedly uh, geographically, geographically situated in Europe and then, ex and then expands out. It's a very Eurocentric view of history, but um, nonetheless, this is where people pinpoint it. And I think that, you know, its its consequences, its repercussions uh, up into today are are felt. I mean, we still have uh, philosophers, thinkers, savants, whatever, still talking about the Enlightenment, right? So, but I think, and what Austin and I were discussing is, we should try to, you know, also look at the influences because I think there's a lot of Arab and Islamic influence for which the Enlightenment is absolutely grateful for, right? Or they don't say they are, but well, some of the early thinkers did. I mean, right. this is what, when you were saying before about it being geographically centered in Europe. What's interesting to me is there's always this conflict with the Enlightenment between its sort of supposedly culturally specific roots and its claims of universality that it applies, you know, to all mankind. Uh, but one of the things that's really interesting is that if you look at the Enlightenment not as sort of starting from scratch, but you put it in a historical context, which was, uh, you know, in Venice and Andalusia and all around the sort of southern parts of Europe in the Mediterranean, they had access to this huge wealth of knowledge which was amassed by the Arab empires and the Islamic empires, sort of, um, most of which wasn't, there wasn't a huge amount of original work done inside the Arab empire except in sort of medicine and astronomy. In the more um, abstract things like mathematics and philosophy, what they did, though, was gather together this huge wealth of knowledge, you know, from India, Greece, blah, blah, blah. And so, of course, all, all the Greek philosophy that we know, the ancient Greek philosophy, we know because it was translated into Arabic first and then translated back from Arabic. And then people learn it in Greek, you know, um, just to sort of... Which is part of this myth that was created where... Uh, which, which was an after-the-fact myth, after the Enlightenment had started to take off, right. um, there was this after-the-fact sort of uh, colonial imperial myth created where it all happened in Greece and Rome and then nothing for 1,700 years or whatever, and then we just sort of found it all. I remember um, when, I was, when I first studied philosophy, like one of the first classes we did, I could, probably the first class I did at university philosophy, would have been in the first couple of weeks anyhow, we were learning the fragments, because they were the pre-Socratic fragments, you know, fragments of thinkers that existed before, um, uh, who were earlier than Socrates, like, yeah, you know, exactly. Clytus and stuff. And I'm like, oh, you mean, like, they found just pieces of the parchment, or, like, there are bits of pottery, 
with this quote on it, like fragments. I'm thinking, yeah. <laughs> and like no, these were trans. These are these are quotes in other works by Arab scholars, by Muslim philosophers, and we have them in the context of these works by the Arabs. It just doesn't exist. I, I want to give one more. Um, like really, I thought it was an incredible example. This goes even back. This goes back even further. Uh -huh. uh, this is when I was like in primary school learning about uh, mathematics and learning how we got the uh, what they told me at the time was the Hebrew number system, right? Like they <laughs> <laughs> wow. Let's go with that, right? Exciting. Um, and what happened is there's this guy in Italy and he wants to have a career and like eat the hamburger and fuck the girl and he's competing with this other guy who also wants to eat his hamburger and fuck his girl and take his job and they're competing to see who's the best at maths, right? And then he sails away and the boat just like goes off screen to the far east where he learned the mysteries of mathematics and then he sailed back <laughs> and hit the guy and got the hamburger and fucked the girl, you know what I mean? Right, like that's right. What they taught us was like, remember this Italian dude's name. That's all you need to know. The actual interesting part, the cool bit he did of traveling and studying and learning, we learn we learn absolutely nothing about because that would that would mean um, looking at what you know the extra European roots of the Enlightenment, exactly. which have been uh, like hidden, but which are, of course are a huge asset since the Enlightenment's claim is all about universality. Um, yeah. I, you know, I think there's a really I don't have the scholarship uh, background to do it. Um, you know, we really need someone who's good, really, really good in Arabic to do this. But to sort of tease out the threads between sort of Islamic universalism and the uh, universalism of the Enlightenment is I, would I think be really interesting and the right. different conceptions of God in Christianity and Islam also I think would be a relevant discussion there because there's the, you know the Christian God is much more a sky God with a penis who comes down to earth and fucks women from time to time <laughs> whereas the Islamic God is much more a sort of universal force without a dick that doesn't come right. down to earth and fuck chicks sometimes um, so there's less of a it's a less sort of obvious conflict uh, between the sort of universalism and um, rationality, right? No, 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 uh, absolutely. Which, which, Islam. which, which I, someone else is an expert to talk about that. People should tell us who they think would be good. Right, exactly. And and also, I think, I mean, just in terms of like God and Islam, I mean, the the whole idea that you're not allowed, like that, you you don't imagine who or what God is, like. It, God is beyond the imaginable. So it, God can actually be anything from the universe to whatever, if you if you choose to pinpoint it, right? Which is, I think, in an interesting idea of like an infinite universalism, right? But I guess to get really interesting stuff like that inside Christian theology too, which we shouldn't um, write off. And I think it's it's one of the big problems with the, with the, the the sort of legacy of you know Enlightenment rationalism, especially as practiced by your fucking Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens types, right. that it, it, it's like if if the wisdom takes it more than a second to sort of um, unfold, you know, if there's if there's layers of meaning that are ambiguous, they just don't want to play. You know what I mean? They right, just don't right, want to play at all, and they will just shut down the discussion because no, you have to play by our very very tightly defined rules, which you know ends up and they end up. But I mean, they don't even play by their own rules, those guys. So let's not use them. No, no, exactly. And 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 so I guess so I guess we can start since we have a bit of an introduction that is uh, a bit floating everywhere, right? Um, I, but that's I mean, the background. Th that's the background, exactly. And it, it, it's huge, and there's tons of literature on this. So if you're interested in that, you know, go check it out. We can send you links and whatnot. Um, Ask any questions you like. Right. Also. And so I would I would like to kind of like begin with this whole idea, like at least from a conceptual level, of you know the marriage between natural law, politics, and science, in the sense that you have the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution happening side by side, right? And this gets kind of accounted for into such thinkers as uh, Voltaire, John Locke, Rousseau, who try to say, well, if science is based off of this whole uniform. Uh, series of rationally thinkable laws that we could define all of nature through, then, then, of course, this has to exist for through politics. And for example, this is where they start coming up with social contract theory, right? Yep, yep, yep. This is, and it's the idea is you know, these natural laws 
provide the basis for our political and social laws to form from. You know, it's, exactly. it's a very religious kind of thinking, even though the idea of God is technically removed. These, removed, these right. laws are given, and since they're given that we can't challenge, we have to work with them. Um, but I mean, that all, like, it, I, I think, you know, go on a little bit, but uh, like, it, it was very quick progression from these ideas once once the conversation started, you know? Right, right. No, absolutely. But which is where where what, what I'm kind of interested in, in trying to understand is that the legacy, the where, where we end up today, is that, you know, we're given this whole idea of, like, constitutionalism, the whole idea that we give up our rights, which is a concept that is, you know, basically, like, founded into enlightenment. We give up our rights collectively to some entity that is above us, and that entity will give us our rights back but secure them as a collective, right? Or, or, or we compromise on our massive, uh, uh, like on, on the unbridled freedom of a state of nature, this mythical state of nature. Exactly, that exactly. Was created. Yeah. And so, like, my, you know, my question is, and, and, you know, you kind of know my thoughts on this, that I don't, I don't believe in this. I mean, of course, there was never this, you know, state of nature. There was never a time when we were all just being anarchic and brutal and, and trying to kill each other. And then we said, oh, wait. And then we that's... all got together and had a discussion and said, yeah. hey, let's form a society. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's, it's a fucking wank from the Enlightenment philosophers thinking, you know, well, it's oh. Obviously, it's obvious that they were using this as an intellectual tool, I think. I don't think they believed it really happened, um, but it was the natural way to fit for them. It was a sort of a, an obvious way for them to approach the product problem. Because again, yeah, you were talking before about how, you know, science, politics, and what we now call philosophy mm -hmm. were all one thing back then. But at the time, all of them were, all, they were all just philosophy. Anything that was sort of based on sort of scholarly, rigorous thinking was right. called philosophy, and that included, you know, what everything. And this is what's really interesting is that there was there was a big project to unify the different areas of thought. It was assumed that that's what would happen. You know what I mean? That right. science, that the various fields of science, for a start, would all would 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 all start would relate to each other um, in a sort of a way where each would be the application of the last, where you know physics is the master science, and then you know everything else was meant to be um, sort of built upon that, right? By building physical right. models, you would understand how animals worked. I mean, you really see this in Descartes. Like, it's he's the one mm -hmm. who we probably get the most good, you know, because Descartes, uh, for people who don't know, is uh, you know from Scandinavia somewhere. I'm trying to. He was Dutch or what? Where Descartes? Was no, no, no. He was French. No. French, I'm sorry, but he, was, he spent a lot of time in Holland. <laughs> exactly. But he also used to make these elaborate drawings, these beautiful drawings, which were very, very clever. Um, and he, you know, he had like bodies, pictures of the body, right, mm -hmm. which involved um, the nervous system as a kind of hydraulic system. He imagined the nervous system. He didn't have the idea of sort of a charge moving along a nerve, so he had them as like tubes. Which would like push a sort of a fluid along, and that's how the nervous system, system works. Would, so you, right. So you, yeah, but you imagine everything is imagined as a physical clockwork system, and right. this is one of the key. This was the key underlying idea, which was meant to tie it all together. Right. We touched on this the last time, but I think it's yeah. this is really one of the most interesting. I think the most least appreciated elements of uh, the sort of. The rapid, the, the way the, the the enlightenment sort of, it it, it, it took off so quickly that it, it destroyed itself actually early on, in the sense that it undermined its original aims early on. Because right, it, exactly. what it wanted to do, what I think what it came up with by accident in the process was better, but what it wanted to do was create this idea of okay, I can imagine that when this uh, cup, this coffee cup, and this marijuana grinder try and occupy the same physical space, they can't, right? <laughs> right. And then if I pull on this, this uh, you know, thing, there's going to be traction that way. And these are sort of physical uh, realities that we experience every day. And right. they said, okay, let's just accept that and then build our model of the universe on top of that. Um, but Newton destroyed everything. Right. right. And, and destroyed everything. Because he had action at a distance. Gravity acts at a distance. There's no physical contact between us and the uh, the objects that are having a gravitational pull on us. 
And this was the big, and you know, he was like, okay, well, look, at a future date, someone will discover some, you know, some physical mechanism, some tiny little string, right. or whatever it is, you know what I mean, that, that uh, explains, that brings this back to the original process. But that never happened. What he just found, what, what just occurred was we found these rules worked, they described what happened in, 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 our, in the universe again and again and again, and so we kept using them. And then we came up with other sets of rules which we can't even relate back to them. We can't even relate the rules of, um, you know, say, we can't relate the rules of uh, natural selection and biology back to physical rules in any meaningful way. It's just a separate No, discussion. absolutely. Exactly. And these are all, all the different sciences are now all separate discussions, and philosophy is separate from that, and this is the opposite of what the Enlightenment thinkers thought they would achieve. Right, exactly. By the right. same token, I don't think that means that you give up on empiricism, because you know, like, sure, it might not work tomorrow, but it's been working better than any other system in human history. Right, which I guess gets back to one of the conversations that we were having at the B at, on our Zero episode on uh, planning this whole thing, which is, right, the, the uniformity of nature. And, of course, all these ideas are kind of based off of a sort of uniformity of what they called natural laws or laws that could be rationally thought of, but... In the end, my, my problem with this and where I think the Enlightenment has gone like radically wrong and we, we see this in the 20th century um, is when it starts relating these, this idea that is borrowed from science and tries to bring it back into politics, right? And so, but I guess before we get to that level, just to like address questions on, on this whole idea of the, are, there are these natural laws that we can rationally conceive of, you know, the way we interact, such as gravity, for example, no, okay, I, I agree. I am someone that doesn't believe in the uniformity of nature. I think tomorrow, who the fuck knows, you know, like maybe gravity will stop existing and something will happen. Um, I think, you know, the idea that now, uh, you know, quantum physics and, uh, and a lot of more abstract uh, thinking, though, is supposedly rooted in uh, empiricism, um, you know, it, it, it's not... We're not getting anywhere, and it doesn't relate back to this whole idea of grand unification theory, right? Which is what they were originally trying to get to, which some people still dream of today. But we're we're so far gone from that that it's it's we're not going to happen. Further from it. Right? We're exactly we're moving further and further from that. Oh my God, I can't remember the name of it. I'll look for it and put it in the Facebook group, which everyone should Definitely. join. But there was a paper from the '60s which which discussed this, and it's this, it was the beginning of a lot of work in complexity theory mm -hmm. and dynamic theory. But it was like, look, guys, we just cannot reduce what happens at one level. We cannot reduce what happens at the, the biological level to the chemical level. And we right. cannot reduce what happens at the chemical level to the physical level. These are separate paradigms, and we just have to, you know... And there are complex bridging sciences, but these are, these are very imperfect. And I think, the yeah, the what's... Um, What's shocking, I think, for a lot of people when they dig back is that is how early on this kind of like it was in the like Hume and Locke and stuff started to sort of and Newton and so forth all kind of realized these problems, but they were just kind of put in the too hard basket mm -hmm. for the for the intervening three hundred years because there was so much practical stuff happening, you know, off the back of Newton's completely illogical, just based on observation. There's no actual logic as to why. Newton's laws should apply. We just notice that they happen to. They're set right. as if by divine fiat, right? Mm -hmm. uh, these, because of these rules, though, we could develop mechanics and bicycles and you know steam trains and planes and and rovers on Mars. So the problem kind of got left, you know, by the wayside while we're sort of rushing ahead with all the the, the successes that it enabled. You know? Right. Right. No, I, 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 we are still lost. No, no, no. We, we dust in like dust in the fucking universe. Right, exactly. And which, for like, I don't know. Like, uh, like one of the things that I think um, was interesting is that Immanuel Kant uh, wrote wrote an essay called "What Is Enlightenment," and he kind of looked back on this moment in history that which he was. We could almost say that he was a part of also, you know, though at the later end of it. Right. And he was saying that this is when people or, or people, civilization or what, whatever you want to call it, history was developing. 
and we were actually making the step forward out of ignorance. And what the Enlightenment marked was this step forward for man to get out of ignorance. And and Michel also uh, Michel Foucault also wrote an article like many years on, right? That titled the same thing: "What is Enlightenment?" And he reviews Kant and says, you know. I think, I think it's a bit difficult. He doesn't want to categorize the Enlightenment as something good or bad, positive or negative, but he's trying to get to the point that, you know, the whole idea of Enlightenment, I, I think, is, is interesting when we put it back into the idea of a geographically situated era, such as one that happened in Europe and America, in the West in general, and... And what happens after that, you know? Colonialism still continues. If not, it gets become it becomes more rampant after that. Well, it was it was it was, it was definitely the two things kind of expanded, exploded together. Right, together. And and then also you have thinkers like, you know, Hegel and and others that that or Voltaire and also John Locke that say, you know, that this is progress. This is development. This is mankind taking the next step forward. Let's not, forget, let's not forget how why they were saying that. In their immediate lived experience, they were seeing the world transformed. You know, there was also, it wasn't always good transformations. I mean, as, you know, uh, right. in the terms of industrialization and uh, overpopulation and so forth. But there was, they, were, they were seeing the, the world physically transformed around them. That's, that's, you know, there was something real happening. That's right, sure. right, exactly. But they, they weren't contextualizing that to their own situation. And then in the end, they say, oh, well, we're the enlightened society, civilization. Well, we're going to take this around the world and we're going to, you know, try to implement that. You know, the white man's burden, right? Like the barrel of a fucking gun. Exactly, you know, and, and that's yeah, well, considered you first take, development. First you, have to sort of, first, you have to sort of wipe out the previous contributions that the rest of humanity has made. You know, like, mm -hmm. sort of forget the fact that we're standing on the shoulders of giants here, that, you know, Egyptians figured out the circumference of the earth to within 1%, you know, before, <laughs> before we had numbers. Exactly. Um, you know, like, that they, that, but this is the thing, you know, there was this huge wealth in, of, of knowledge in the ancient world that mostly has been lost. Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and, but this is a lot of that fed down. In, oh, interesting side note, I forgot to do this before. You know the, the, the big... Black gowns that we wear at uh, when we graduate from university. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's meant to look like an abaya, uh, an Arab gown. That's why you would wear it when you became a scholar, because your professors were like, especially in Andalusia, and the, the most wise men came from the east, you know. Wow, and so you awesome. wanted to wear the long flowing robes like them, and like priests wear. And you know what I mean? Like you know, right, right. it all it all comes from there, from the center of the world, and then re and like we catch it in Europe a little while later and put our own spin, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But yeah, so, but but here's the thing, right? And this is I want this is this is getting into politics and a little bit off philosophy, but it also it reminds me of um, it's a question that comes up with the Roman Empire and a question which comes up with you know the British Empire and the American Empire and every empire. Mm -hmm. is that what happens is you have this, and it it kind of you can see how it feeds right all the way into a fascist way of thinking because the in group, the yeah. citizens, are way more egalitarian with each other. Right, mm -hmm. and what right. that produces, there's more fairness internally, and that produces a, a greater level of meritocracy, mm -hmm. right, where you can rise on merit rather than just on position right. uh, and on social class. Although that's you know never goes away, um, but the and but what that allows them to do is being fairer to each other allows you to be more effectively unfair to others who are outside the circle. Right, exactly. You know, and, this is, and this is what the Enlightenment was, this extreme version of this. You know, a great deal of internal egalitarianism developed in Europe and democracy, and what that allowed was them to develop these incredibly efficient armies and navies to go around the world raping and pillaging. Uh, right. And which, which is where, where I kind of... I, I don't honestly believe that, like, the Enlightenment was a step forward for humanity or however they wanted to conceive of themselves at that time. In fact, I think it's interesting that you have like accounts from from people that were dur during the French Revolution that were for the French Revolution but did not believe in capital punishment. So they did not believe in the state going in and killing all these people, which they were considered uh, what do you call it? Uh, for, you know, former regime because they didn't you know agree with the whole like yeah, they're counter revolutionary because they didn't agree with killing off these uh, you know these people. They said, "Hey, wait, the state shouldn't have this power." And so 
My my problem is though is like the legacy of. Here's the thing, man. Those ideas, those like where those ideas are so enlightenment. The idea that the state shouldn't have the power of life and death over its citizens. I don't know if you can find like I mean I think probably in you know like monotheistic universalism you might find the first sort of hints of that. But really, it's something that comes out of the enlightenment. The idea that you have rights independent of what's given to you by a state or a king or a god. But actually, I would say the Enlightenment is, is in a way, actually almost the complete opposite, or at least the legacy of the Enlightenment is, because they're the ones that basically, you know, inform our situation now and say, hey, look, you know, the state is going to be your protector. So the state is going to be able to protect your rights. It's going to ensure it. We're going to create a judiciary. We're going to do all the all these things <clears throat> for you, the citizen, right? But, but that that does nothing for me. Who who am I as a citizen? You know. Oh, man, and, it does and, and, a lot for you. It does a lot for you, man. You don't realize, I guess. I mean, I think it, well, one thing before I want to say, like, because we're now getting onto the political element of it, and oh, if we're talking, oh, which, right, right, right. We're just, no, 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 if we're talking about the political element of it, and we uh, before I talked about the sort of extra European roots, right, right. We, um, in terms of philosophy and intellectualism, mostly that came from the East, but in terms of the radical idea of, you know, natural rights and, uh, you know, democracy and even federalism and stuff like that. A lot of that came from right. uh, West, came from the indigenous peoples of the, the New World who had much more uh, egalitarian models as well. So that's just one other thing that's feeding in there and you got to you got to take, the Enlightenment was, a, a lot of it was Europe sucking up everyone else's good ideas. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But... So that, but, but you talk about your rights as a citizen, man. I think you like, come on, man. Like, don't, don't, don't discount it entirely. You've seen what what can happen in fucking uh, nasty places, you know. Like, you know that there's that maybe your your rights aren't absolute and your freedom isn't perfect. But me and you, as members of this enlightenment community, who have like benefited from its from inclusion in it, right? Right, right. Us at least, we get huge benefits. No, 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 absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that. I, I think my problem, my problem is, is like, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not checking my privilege. Like, I realize, I, I, I'm an American citizen. I am privileged in having a U.S. passport, in which it means that I enter Egypt on a fifteen dollar visa, and you know, no problem, whatever, you know. Yeah. Whereas if they want to fly to America, they like have to get like, yeah, go through the, the third degree and no. hundred. Thousands of dollars and blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Absolutely. Which is, but which is where my thoughts kind of. I, I'm trying to say that fuck the Enlightenment, fuck what they've given us. Because in the end, what have they done? They have given us a system to be able to control populations within certain boundaries. Like if we relate Enlightenment to colonialism and what has happened since then, you know. And, and uh, again, th this all goes back to the political philosophy that was being developed during this mo these moments. And what I'm trying to say is like, no, wait, wait, what, why do borders matter? Why do I necessarily have to be considered part of a, you know, geographically situated community? But, I don't, but borders, I'm not sure, I mean, like, maybe the modern nation state in its current formulation is a product of modernity and the Enlightenment. Yeah, um, absolutely. But I don't think borders necessarily are nor, issue, nor elements of state control. You know, the idea that you should be able to move freely and, you know, like, the world is, we are all citizens of the world. I mean, that's, that screams cunt. You know no, no, I mean? no, no, but I'm not saying, I'm not saying I'm a cosmopolitan. I, I, I want to get, I'll let you go back to what your point is, but I want you to include, like, the Habermas idea. Habermas is a European philosopher right. who's very deep in the postmodern tradition, and he works, uh, you know, I think he's, he was Frankfurt School um, yeah, guy, yeah. I'm pretty sure, right? Yeah, yeah, and I mean, he comes out of Which is, like, yeah. the core of the postmodern anti-rational thing. But there's some really interesting moments where he sort of comes back around to fairly liberal positions, where you know where the where the discourse um, of where where where, where a communications discourse, he, you know, like he talks about being able to communicate as um, as sort of receptive uh, equals. I'm not probably not using the right language, but there's right. a lot of moments where he comes back around to sort of taking the liberal position because at least that's something that you can hold the states to. You can go to the governments and say, no, you're not protecting our rights, but rather than saying, all oh, this is a myth and it's all intellectually false, which is, might be an interesting line of argument to take, there's the right. political expediency of, like, if we say we don't believe in these rights, then how, do, like, then how do we frame our desire 
not to get shot in the face and not for other people not to get shot in the face on the whim of whoever has a gun, you know? How do you define any right beyond might uh, without some kind of universal framework? I, I, right. Which is where, which is where, it, I mean, this relates directly back to the Enlightenment, the whole idea of universality, which I think also, you know, was was the moment where cosmopolitanism tries to come out too, you know, right? This whole, you know, political philosophy of we're all together in this, you know, and and we're all experiencing it. But my, like, for example, my my issue with this, and I think Habermas is interesting in so much as he talks about a public sphere, but I think we need to reinvent what this public sphere means. I think we need to expand these ideas to include things like the right internet. Now. Right, no, no, we're exa exactly. And it's to like, you know, push these ideas as far along as we can. And so my problem is, though, is that the things that we benefit from enlightenment, I, I think that, okay, you know, borders, nationalism, the state, and whatnot, like, it it happens, right? It, it occurs, and, and we're living in these contexts, even, for example, like, you know, you're, you're having a conversation about Egypt earlier today, and, and it's like, all right, so if I say, look, I don't believe in a country or a border, how do I participate, me personally, into, into a moment like this? And how am I guaranteed that these rights are happening, you know, universal rights, whatever you want to call them? And my issue with this, though, is that there is no universality. I, I don't believe. I think all of it comes from these sort of cultural paradigms that we are existing in that kind of construct us, socially construct us, and place us into a certain historically situated moment, right? So you and I both experienced the Egyptian Revolution. And like we talked about the other day, you know, we kind of pretended like it was part of our revolution, you know, or what we were trying to do. And and in some ways, I, I kind of try to reflect on that and say like it wasn't all pretense. There is something going on. That no, there is something going on, and and we are also participating. Whether other people want to use a discourse of xenophobia and say, well, what are you doing intervening in my country, which is also rooted in nationalism, and we saw what nationalism did, it, like or at least the Enlightenment right. gave rise to nationalism. We have modern states, and then you have you know. National socialists coming out and fascists, you know, going around and and yeah, and Darwinian, organizing. Darwinian theories led straight to the to the idea of racial superiority and exactly. Sort of, and so I and mean, so, bad interpretations of them, but right, they were right. they did feed it. They, they, yeah, I guess, but I I don't know, man. Like I th I feel like the problem is still not enough enlightenment, not too much. But in, in what sense, though? Like, are you saying that like we should go back to Enlightenment thinkers and kind of like rethink these ideas? Well, in, the sense, in the sense that we should use more rationality and less violence and superstition in our thinking. And I think that that sounds like I'm now taking just the Dawkins line, but I am certainly not. You know what I mean? Like the the right. essence of the essence of uh, Enlightenment and rationality to me is communication and empathy. And this is where I think Habermas mm. is really good. I don't right. like his language, but uh, you know this is my problem with a lot of postmodern philosophers is just the language is so difficult and academic and technical, and I feel like they could use simpler terms. But right. um, he, you know, the, this idea that you know because he talks about instrumental rationality and communicative rationality. Mm -hmm. This is the big yeah. divide he makes, and that has a very strong echo of Kant and his sort of use people treat people as an ends in themselves. Rather than a means to another end. Uh, absolutely, that absolutely. Being, if I'm communicating with you like I'm doing now, I'm trying. I imagine what it's like to be you, and for you to have a certain experience of communicating with me is the end goal, right? Whereas if I'm actually just using you, if mm -hmm. I'm just using you to to advance my own ends, to advance my career, to make myself more famous, and just talking to you as uh, an object that I'm using you like an instrument of my own right, right, And right. So that to me is a very basic kind of morality uh, that, that pops up again and again and again in different places and I think is hard to um, argue with. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, uh, but like it's not about, it's not so much about establishing, okay, out there in the universe there are these physical laws. Um, it's not so much about establishing out th there's this sort of empirical rule. It's my mate Daniel McKizak. He's got a book that he keeps talking about writing. You know uh -huh. Daniel, another yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy, yeah. Um, Kiwi guy. But he's got a, he's got a book. He wants he keeps talking about writing called I Am and So Are You. And that 
is the sort of minimal standard we need to agree on before we can, you know, go forward. We need to, forward, you exist, right. you matter, and so do I, and we can communicate in a language that's meaningful to both of us. I mean, that's, that's what I'm not prepared to give up from the Enlightenment. You know, maybe we're all in the fucking matrix, but if we are, then we fucking are, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 absolutely. And, and I think, though, but the whole idea of that we agree on certain principles, I think is going to be fucking, it's, it's fucking difficult, man. Like, okay, you and I, we might have very different ways to coming to certain conclusions, but somehow we still arrive at, at very similar conclusions, and we believe at least in the kind of in the kind of existence that we're experiencing, right? In, in the sense that we are we are trying to be as equal to each other as possible, despite privilege, despite you know our cultural heritage, despite all the things that socially construct us. We're at least trying to get to that point. Right, and so, and so. But my problem is, is though, dude. What what do you do when you're when you're in the fucking suburbs of America and people are discussing, you know, oh well, I just fucking redid my back lawn and it cost me this much money. And how much do you make? Because I make six figures, like. But you know, well, and it's like you can do one thing you can do, which I think we haven't been doing enough of on the left or in the progressive side, is tell them they're disgusting. This is something I like about Zizek that he wants to reclaim a sense of moral righteousness for the left. Right, right. You know, right. like, and he talks about like, um, what's his name? I forget some American politician. I don't even remember. I don't follow this bullshit, but mm -hmm. he does a little bit, and he's like, this guy, uh, you know, um, he not only did he just, he started cheating on his wife. While he was fucking, like, while she was in hospital, like, dying of cancer. And then mm -hmm. he made her divorce him before she died so he could move on to his new mistress, like, marry his new mistress faster. And he's just like, these people, and this is a guy who still, like, he's on the, he's on the religious right. Right, right, and they right, can, right. And they can do this shit because no one on the left wants to be seen to be moralizing anymore. No one on the left right. wants to be seen to be taking the moral high ground. Yet, we have this inverse of it. Where rather than take the moral high ground in a, in, a, in a way where you condemn people's actions, we just take the moral high ground in a way where you condemn their identity as a privileged identity, uh -huh. which no, is, no, no. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, like maybe this is, we probably should start wrapping it up because we're moving on from the Enlightenment. Yeah, and, yeah, we are, uh, we are. But, but at least the whole point is, is like, like okay, so we, we've expanded on all these ideas and, and it's like, how do we radicalize them? Because right, th this is the whole point of the vlog, like, how do we radicalize ideas and as such radicalize action? And so I guess to like wrap it up from my perspective, because I mean I'm rolling a cigarette, I'm ready to go smoke, um, is that, okay, what does the Enlightenment mean to us today? Like what the fuck are we doing with the Enlightenment? We have borrowed so many ideas from it today that still exist as superstructures within our lives, and what do we say? Do we say, hey, you know, I think the Enlightenment is a beautiful thing in my life. I think that I can reflect on these thinkers and the ideas that they have borrowed, um, not only from science, but to philosophy and to ethics, to morality, to also politics. You know, what, what, what does this mean for me? And, and at least for me personally, I say we need to deal with this idea of Enlightenment or the idea of progress and development as situated in culturally... Um, in, in cultural paradigms, like, for example, what I was talking about, you know, in the suburbs of America, like, you have people that think that progress means gaining more money, and the more money I spend and the more money I gain means the more, you GDP, know, the, GDP, the GDP, the yeah. higher status I have in society, and what I'm trying to say, or the better off that I can live a good life, right? And what I'm trying to say is that, you know, the repercussions of enlightenment are fall off in multiple trajectories, and I think the one that we should start focusing on is the one in which we no longer conceive of ourselves as individuals because this is an, an off, a, a byproduct of enlightenment, right? Like me as an individual give my right to the state, to whatever, or well, me it's as about an individual. We've taken that individualism to a, to a dangerous extreme now right. where everybody basically has the right to be left alone and exactly. to, to buy whatever they can afford. Because I have my rights, right, and it's and it's guaranteed by the state, and and so who gives a fuck if they're spying on me? Like, who gives a fuck if they're like recording, you know, this call? Like, whatever. Like, I'm making money. They're, they're I'm gonna doing guarantee whatever. my ability to get fifteen different kinds of fucking donut and uh, right. you know, and, and yeah, 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 yeah. 
You know? Look, man, I think I think there's there's that element of it, but there's also fucking robots on Mars. There's also you know. Yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. That, that, like, here's the thing. Like, Steven Pinker wrote a great book called um, "The Better Angels of Our Better Angels." I think meaning better angels of our nature. And one of the things that traces is that even even the sec the 20th century, even with the horrific violence of the two world wars included, is actually like a less violent than average century. And there is a trend away from violence. There's a trend towards longer life expectancies, towards healthier, happier lives while we are alive, despite like the power of modernity is so great that it can generate these huge problems, but the benefits that it generates are vaster even. But modernity right? is different and than enlightenment, right? True, 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 true. True. And we can, which is and maybe we'll do modernity. Let's do modernity uh, next time, perhaps. Right, and have right. A of enlightenment. They're very related, you know. Um, they, they are. They are. But also, I'm like, sorry, I, should have, I should have been more um, acute in my diagnosis. <laughs> than, <laughs> no, no. Anyway, let's leave. Let's leave. I think we've we've talked heaps, right? Let's let everyone else in the Facebook group contribute. Right. Um, and uh, we've got another week. We'll do this again next Monday, and everyone should join in the discussion before then. And Absolutely, Tell us what but, be, but before we but before we sign off, I would I would like to say like I think you should propose an idea. I propose an idea, and let people on Facebook propose an idea of like what our next episode should be. So, I personally like the idea of, you know, t like inviting people. You know, like so it's not just us having these like conversations. So, but in order to do that, that means that our polls need to be done like at least enough before our episode that we can invite people and say, hey, look, people chose you, they want you the in it. We have to put up the poll for next week tonight after we... Tonight, exactly. And so, I don't know, my thought right now, I'm interested in the whole idea of, like, bionic technology or technology interfacing with humans. Like, what does this mean for our future? What does this mean for us now? What does this mean philosophically? It somehow relates to science, but it's like, where do we go with this, you know? And... and uh, <laughs> Are the philosophical yeah, yeah, yeah. grounds for that played out? You know, like that—that's my proposition. Yours? Well, would that be part of a general science episode? Because we didn't get to the whole philosophy. It could be philosophy of science question. It All could right. be. So you're, you're proposing science and bionics, right? I'm gonna go. Yeah. Let's. Uh, my suggestion is um, modernity and uh, political philosophy. How like political philosophy, modern political philosophy emerged. All right. Modern political philosophy. Let's just fuck yeah. That. Which do includes it. modernity and, and what that right, is. Right, right, of course. All right, so Before let's we, and, do that. And, and that'll open up. Uh, like, in terms of getting people on, the two people that I really want to get on are a Marx expert and a Foucault expert. Because right. to me, these are the two, like, you know, these, these are our fucking, uh, these are the two main currents that right. we're uh, representing here. So, um, yeah, but I don't think we should do that yet. I think we let's let's put a little bit more groundwork, get a little bit more of the feel of the show going. So when right. they come in, they don't just come in and give us another feel like they would in a university. No, 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 absolutely, lesson. absolutely. And, and and like for me, I mean, I'm personally interested in bringing Maya Williams on with us to talk about yeah, race fun. and feminism and what that all means today for us, uh, you know, kids and. And also, I think Joe Lukowski would be good to talk about what the city means and philosophy and what that means for us in these days, you know, that we're experiencing, you know, kind of these, like, urban transformations happening radically in hyper-real terms, you know, right? So, anyway, we have suggestions out there. Let's get your feedback. Don't forget right. the sign-off, man. Don't forget the sign-off. I'm not going to hey, hit Hey, I'm not. I'm not. Hey, hey wait, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. People, take it easy. But take it.